There's a scene in Slaughterhouse Five. Rickard Vonnegut contrasts the British prisoner of war camp in Dresden and the American prisoner of war camp. In the American prisoner of war camp, the soldiers just just sitting around, each in his own world, miserable. They have no group activities. Everyone just sits there and mopes and is depressed. And a couple of them are plotting revenge, not against the Germans, against other members of the camp. Whereas in the British prisoner of war camp, they have activities. They have a daily schedule. The group works together. They clean up their place. Everybody is clean shaven. Everybody is bathed. They put on plays. They even have a little newspaper, if I remember correctly. In other words, they make the best of a bad situation. And as a result, they don't feel powerless. And as the plot of the novel shows, when people are left powerless or feeling powerless, they either go into depression, or as I said, they plot revenge. The death of the main character in the novel comes from one of his other fellow prisoners, who, after being released, tracks him down and kills him. So this is a good object lesson at a time like this, where with the virus striking anybody, and you're looking at the situation in the world, it just seems to be like a slow motion train wreck. It's very easy to feel powerless. To feel like there's nothing you can do. Which is why this is an especially good time to think about the Buddhist teachings, to take them to heart. Because they're all about the amount of power you do have. Now, sometimes we hear the opposite. They teach you about how everything is in constant stressful, not self, beyond your power to make permanent. And although it's true, you can't make a fabrication permanent. You can make fabrications that lead to well-being in this life, in future lifetimes, and the ultimate well-being, which is nirvana. In fact, the teachings are all about the power that we do have. Look at the Buddha's life. He was told again and again that his desire for a deathless happiness was unrealistic. That would be a waste of time, a waste of his youth and his health and his life. But as he saw, those things, youth, health, life, were all going to be wasted away anyhow. It would be much better to devote them to the quest of something that did not grow old, did not sicken, did not die. And he found that. That's a huge power right there. A human being can do this. That's what we take as our inspiration. And the Buddha shared some of his powers with us. He lists at one point the ten powers of a Tathagata, someone who has truly gone to the other side. And three of them he shares. Knowledge of actions, what kind of actions lead to good results, what kind of actions lead to middling results, what kind of actions lead to bad results. Knowledge of the worlds that there are. And knowledge is how you can get to the different worlds. In other words, he says, this, these are the possibilities of happiness, and these are the things you can do to find that happiness. It's all laid out. And we can borrow that. It's not our full possession yet until we've attained awakening, our first taste of awakening, to see that the Buddha was right. But in the meantime, we can borrow it. And it gives us a sense of our power, that options are open to us, meaningful options. You can see this by comparing funeral rites in, in different religions. I remember the funerals of my childhood. They were all pretty hopeless affairs. 
a very strong sense of powerlessness. God was supposed to be loving, and he had taken our loved ones away, sometimes in very miserable ways. And we had to accept that. We had no idea where they were going, especially in the versions of Christianity where they teach predestination. You have no power at all to decide where you're going, and there's nothing that those people who are remaining can do to help. They simply have to accept. Whereas in Buddhist funerals, even though there is some sadness, there's a very strong sense where you know what you can do, and you know that will be of help. You may not know 100 percent, but you have a strong sense of confidence. Reliable people, the kind of people who can know these kinds of things, say that, yes, you can help people have passed on. And then you look at your own life, and you realize that it's going to be your turn, and you've got to be prepared. And you can prepare. And John Lee compares it to knowing that you're going to have to be suddenly sent to a foreign country. So you make your preparations. You change your money into the currency of that country. You learn their language, and you get your passport. In his description, you changing the currency means being generous. As the Buddha said, the things you give away are the ones that are going to be saved. It's like being in a burning house. The things you try to keep in the burning house are going to get burned. But if you take them out of the burning house, they get saved. The generosity you have is going to go with you in future lifetimes. Getting your passport is like practicing the precepts, developing virtue, and then learning the language of where you're going. Oh, that's learning how to meditate. But you don't have to wait for the future lifetime in order to shape things. The Buddha also teaches us how we can shape a better lifetime for ourselves right here, right now. For instance, he has the four things that lead to happiness in the here and now. The first is being industrious. You look for ways in which you can improve your life around you, the life of the people around you. And you work at it. You look for ways in which to improve things. Try to find some form of right livelihood and engage in it. And the second quality is that once you've gained your livelihood in a, in a good way, then you try to maintain what you've got. You're not wasteful. You look after things. This is one of the reasons why in the forest tradition there's such a strong tradition of keeping the place clean, keeping the place in good repair. And John Fuang would talk about a John Munn taking old rags and sewing them into cloths for wiping the feet, for using here, using there. There's that great passage in the canon where one king's wives give Ananda lots and lots of robes. I think it's 500 robes. And the king is a little incensed. But what can one person do with 500 robes? So he goes and asks, he goes and asks Ananda. What are you going to do with those 500 robes? He says, I'm going to share them out with the other monks. What are they going to do with the robes they already have? Well, they're going to use them to turn into rags, to wipe this, to clean that. What are they going to do with the rags they have? Well, they're going to shred them, put them, mix them in concrete. That's a short version. Actually, there's all, many more steps in there. They make curtains, they make cushion covers out of the robes first. The king is impressed. And all these Sakyan monks use their things wisely. They're not wasteful. So he gives another 500 robes. The point being that you look after your things. As things wear out, you find another use for them. You don't just throw them away. The 
The third step is that you're frugal, but not too frugal. In other words, you live rightly within your means. You don't spend things wastefully. But at the same time, you're not miserly. And then the fourth quality is to look for admirable friends, associate with good people. They keep your mind in the right place so that your views don't get changed into weird directions. Of course, nowadays this means being very careful about where you wander on the net. Wander in places that encourage you to, to look for what's good in the situation around you. I'm not pretending that there's nothing bad in the situation, but look for opportunities in the situation around you for you to do good. And keeping your views straight. At the same time, having an admirable friend, the, the Buddha said, you're going to be looking for a person with four qualities. And those four qualities are the ones you want to develop for your well-being in the future lifetime. So you know, if death does come, if the virus decides to strike you, and your body decides to react in a way that's going to shut everything down, you know that you have the qualities that you need in order for a good rebirth. I've always been amazed at how the eco-Buddhists say they don't like the idea of rebirth. That it tends to devalue the world right here, right now. But that doesn't understand the process. And one of the better rebirths is to come back here. And the shape in which you leave the world is going to be the shape of the world to which you go. So it's in your best interest to look after the world through developing these four qualities. Conviction, i.e. conviction in the principle of action. Conviction in the Buddha's awakening, but it comes down to conviction in the principle that your actions can make a difference. The present moment as you're experiencing is not just coming in from past actions. It's also coming from what you're doing right now, and you can change that. The virtue, being careful in your speech, not only not lying, but being careful not to speak in a divisive way, not speaking in a harsh way, not speaking idle chatter, i.e. just whatever happened to come into your ears and your eyes comes out your mouth, but that you're thinking about the impact. You have to think about the impact of your words. When I say this, what is this going to do to my mind? What is this going to do to the minds of the people around me? What kind of actions is it going to inspire? And where people are living in close quarters, where, it's funny, we're in close quarters, but we're maintaining social distance. The way we speak to one another has a huge impact on the atmosphere in which we live. and the place to which we'll go. So you try to create a good place here so you have a good place to go through your words. Then there's generosity. We're looking at the potential for the economy to break down. When the economy breaks down, there's a danger of society breaking down. But what keeps society from breaking down is generosity. If you have something to share, be happy to share. As I said earlier, there's that principle that what's in the burning house, what stays in the burning house gets burnt when the burning house burns down. But what gets taken out is what's saved. What's taken out to other people, that becomes your perfection of generosity. And that's yours, something that even death can't take away. And finally, there's discernment, penetrating discernment, as the Buddha says, into what arises and passes away, what's originated and what passes away. The penetrating means you realize that things can pass, pass away and arise, but some things, when they arise, are better than others. And so you look for that. Here's another irony, where we're taught that everything is one. The dualities are bad, but the Buddha's wisdom is basically a wisdom of dualities. X is more skillful than Y, so do X rather than Y.
and figure out how to give rise to X, what the causes are. Because from the very beginning of the path all the way to the end, you'll be making choices. And you want to be alive to the fact that what you're doing, even as you're practicing meditation, even as you're developing insight, there's skillful things to hold on to, skillful things to let go, or things whose letting go is skillful. And you want to discern the difference, and also the right time and the right place. Don't let go of concentration before you've developed it. But no, there will come a time when you have to let it go. The same with insight. You have to give rise to insight, you use it, and then you let it go. We're not here just to arrive at insights. Our insights are part of the path, they're the tool. In the forest tradition, they, many of the Johns use this image. You use the tools of the path, like a carpenter who's building a chair. And when the chair is done, you can put the tools down. Once you have your chair, you can use the tools for other purposes, but you don't need them for the chair that you've got now. That's when we begin to think about going beyond the idea of just looking for a good rebirth to something even better than a good rebirth. But the point of all this is that you have a lot of power in your hands. As John Lee says, there are potentials in the body, potentials in the mind that human beings use only a small fraction of. And the first power you have is to borrow the Buddha's powers, to know that there are actions that are skillful, actions that are unskillful. Be clear about which is which, and then pursue the skillful actions, abandon the unskillful ones. And look for ways in which you can improve yourself right now, you can improve the environment around you. Because you're not the only one who benefits from these actions. You do create your environment by being virtuous. You do create your environment by being careful about what you say. As you exercise sense restraint, as you hold on to right view, as you find time for seclusion, this creates an environment. These five things are listed in the Buddha's instructions to new monks, but they apply to everybody. So in this way, your practice is like an electric current going, running through a wire. It creates a field around it, a good field in this case. So you've got this power. And try to put it to the best use you can think of, because it can take you far.